at Oakland Zoo. We're starting a little late. We had technical issues and I think we're on YouTube and we're missing Facebook, but stay tuned. We will post there soon. What a joy it is to share this world with wildlife. It's way more of a joy than sharing this world with technology tonight. Um, but it is a challenge sometimes and there's hope, especially with you all joining us and with our wonderful guest tonight. Um, we're so glad you're joining us for a shot of hope. It's Cocktails and Conservation, and we want to welcome you back. You're watching Cocktails and Conservation, where we rendezvous with inspiring wildlife conservation leaders from around the planet, hear their stories, learn how they protect the animals we love, and how each of us can help them. With our featured custom cocktail, together we toast to Taking Action for Wildlife. All right, welcome back to Cocktails and Conservation. This is Cocktails and Conservation 2022. It's our third season. And this is where we meet wildlife heroes from around the world. We get to hear their stories. Um, we get to join their solutions. And we get to connect with people like you, people like you who, who also care. This year, we are celebrating 100 years of Oakland Zoo. It's our centennial. Oakland Zoo began in 1922, and we've been inspiring people and, and helping animals for all that time. And so this year, we're featuring a little bit about what Oakland Zoo does, um, which is a lot. And um, this is just an extra special year for us. So we are sharing some of our wonderful stories. Um, again, Cocktails and Conservation allows us to gather together um, and celebrate. So we'd love to see who is here, even just on YouTube. Um, so your name and um, where you're tuning in from, how you found out about it, and we'd love to hear from you. And if you would like to mix up your unforgettable drink from Ali and Vine and Alameda in the chat, um, we will publish that delicious recipe. All right, tonight we are talking about frogs. Um, yep, frogs, those amazing amphibians. And our guest is someone from Oakland Zoo who I get to work with. Her name is Sam Sammons. She's a conservation biologist and she's a frog heroine. Um, she and her team do this critical work um, in California to save frogs, and it is not easy. Oakland Zoo has been at this for over seven years. We've released hundreds of inoculated frogs back into the wild, into beautiful Sierras of California. Um, we're gonna find out more from Sam, and meanwhile, for those listening, what frogs have you seen in the wild yourself and where? All right. And while you're doing that, I am going to welcome our live audience. Those of you that are live, looks like on YouTube and soon on Facebook. And welcome friends of the wild, any frog people, um, conservation community, friends from the National Park Service, Forest Service, UC Santa Barbara, all groups involved. Um, and friends of Allie and Vine and Alameda Animal and Earth Lovers and Tree Huggers, and you're all just so welcome to be here with us. If you want to watch any of the other CNCs, they will be um, a link in the comments. Cocktails and Conservation has 16 other little bits to inspire you, so check those out. And this year, we're going to do one more virtual one like we're doing tonight. Um, that is going to be about Oakland Zoo's rescues, which we've had hundreds over the years. And the other events are going to be live. So we're going to be getting back together. The first one will be on May 11th, and that's going to be at Brooklyn Basin in Oakland. If you haven't been there, it's lovely. We'll be at Rocky's Market in a beautiful outside venue, and we'll be learning all about animals, plants, and people and how they're affected by climate change. Um, our guests will be National Plant Society and Mountain Lion Foundation. And the link to that, to getting a ticket, will be in the chat. All right. Again, Oakland Zoo celebrating our centennial. Um, so we're spotlighting um, one of our, our many projects. Oakland Zoo works to save California condors, bush rabbits, 
um, mountain lions, frogs, herons, a lot of different local animals. Tonight we're talking about frogs and the amazing work done by our guest, Sam Sammons. Um, Sam, she has cared for our, all kinds of animals um, previously to this. Things like sharks, rays, sea turtles, jellyfish. She lives a life aquatic. Um, she's super inspiring for someone so much younger than me. Um, and we're really glad to have her join us. So welcome to Sam Salmons. Wouldn't it be cool if she conserved salmon? That would be amazing. Hi, Sam. <laughs> Great. We're glad to have you. We're sorry for a little tech issue, but um, may this video live on and be shared out in the world. So Sam, where are you right now? You're very like well matched with blue walls and blue sky and blue shirt that looks a lot like my blue shirt. Yeah, um, I'm actually in the conservation office at the zoo right now, uh, which is right next door to the lab where all the frogs are. Oh, at. fantastic. And we love to kind of get to know you before we get to know what you do. So Sam, when you're not in that office taking care of all those frogs and other things you can do, what do you like to do? Oh, so as you said, I'm very aquatic. Um, I like going to the beach, like scuba diving when I can, uh, really just anything outdoors, hiking, um, hanging out with my husband and my dog and my cat pretty much it. <laughs> I love it. No, it's a nice balanced life. All right. Well, we want to get to know a little bit about you. And I was given this ridiculously adorable photo. Um, it looks like you started really young there, Sam. Cutest little redhead there. So like, was there a moment in your life that like you knew you were going to be doing something to help animals? I don't know if there's really like one aha moment for me. Um, like this photo shows, I was really always into science um, and animals just in general. I grew up with animals. I don't think there's ever been a time where I haven't had an animal. <laughs> um, we went to zoos and aquariums all the time when I was little. So I think it's always just been ingrained in me that I would do something kind of like this. Um, wow, I love it. Um, thank you parents for doing that for Sam. Um, and then, so from that moment of you being sp inspired to now, like what was your path to get to have this position? So it was kind of a crazy path. So yeah, like you said, I used to work with uh, fish a lot. So I actually got a degree in marine biology um, and that allowed me to get a job in an uh, aquarium. Um, and it was an AZA aquarium, which was great because then I started learning about AZA and everything that oh. they do. Um, so moving forward, I was always looking for jobs at AZA facilities, which kind of led me out here to Oakland. Um, and I got really lucky to get this job because I had a little bit of amphibian and reptile experience in the past, uh, but this allowed me to learn something new and grow and learn even more, uh, but still use a lot of my aquatic background at the same time. Oh, I love it. Um, well, that's fantastic. You're perfect for this position. Um, but I know you do other things at the zoo because I don't think anyone at Oakland Zoo does one thing. There's too many great things to do there. Um, so let's check out some of the other things you do. It seems like a very job. So Sam, what's happening in this photo? Oh, yes. So one of the other things that I get to do at Oakland Zoo, which I'm really lucky I get to do is I get to help run our urban wildlife study um, using camera traps. Uh, so this is actually a photo of me and our new um, CEO, Nick Deheja, going out and setting up a camera trap in Nolan Park, which is just outside of the zoo, um, which is part of our study. So we get to go out and look at all the different wildlife that's going by. All right, well, that's fun. So are these camera traps all over the East Bay and what are they getting on those traps? Yeah, so we have 18 different cameras, part of our study. Um, they're from the San Leandro Reservoir down to the Bay is kind of where we have them spread out. Uh, we have them at different places like East Bay Regional Parks. Um, there's some private residences and golf courses. Uh, but what we get to see is all the different types of wildlife that moves throughout this area. So we've seen uh, raccoons, opossums, bobcats, coyote, um, 
pretty much any wildlife that you think of that we might see, we have seen. We have not seen a mountain lion yet, but we will. Someday. Sure, someday. someday. <laughs> All right, and then here, it looks like you're with other kinds of beings. What's going on in this photo? Yeah, so I was lucky enough to get to go down to Panama to help one of Oakland Zoo's conservation partners, Caminando. Um, they actually use camera traps to study jaguars. Um, and while we were down there, um, we got to go to a bunch of the local schools and give them supplies. Um, and they all, each school got a banner with the school's name on it. And the um, saying on the banner is Guardians of the Jaguar. It's written in Spanish for all, all the kids down there. But we got to hang out with them, um, teach them about jaguars and other wildlife that's in the area. And we made these really cool masks. So the one girl in the photo, you can kind of see a mask on her head. Um, we all made jaguar masks. So we all right. I love it. And that's camera trap work too, right? Yeah. So we did camera trap work and um, community work down there. Super cool. All right. Let's start talking about frogs. So here's a, here's actually one of the frogs you work with. But in general, Sam, frogs are amazing like what is just something that you love about frogs so yes frogs are just amazing i think one of my favorite things about frogs is that they completely change from one animal essentially to another so <laughs> they all start off as tadpoles for the most part and they completely change into the what most people think of frogs as so what you see in this photo um, but it's not only that they change the outside of them, their insides also change during that process. So it's incredibly weird, but incredibly cool at the same time. Okay, that is that is pretty crazy. And what's one thing you wish everyone knew about frogs? One thing I think I wish everybody knew about frogs, besides how awesome they are, is that um, they're bioindicators, uh, mm -hmm. which means... Uh, they are usually the first ones to notice if something happens to an environment. So frogs and amphibians are just very sensitive to slight changes, whether it's uh, the pH of the ground or maybe some chemicals came into the water or just something doesn't even have to be big, just something small. But because they're so sensitive to it, um, they're usually the first to have a reaction to it. So if frogs start disappearing from an environment, uh, that could mean that there's something larger at play that's happening. Pretty amazing. Thank you, frogs. Um, okay, well, sometimes I'm assuming what they have to show us is not good news. Um, so let's start talking a little bit about what their challenges are. And I'll start with this photo. And I'm excited to give credit to, I think this is a Joel Sartori photo. And he is a friend to so many species all over the world, takes amazing photos and lets us use them to story tell and, and to help. So what is going on here? Yeah, so this is one of the really hard photos and one of the hard things to see, especially working with amphibians, really working with anything. Um, but these frogs um, are dying off due to a disease um, known as chytrid. Um, it's caused by a fungus. It's a worldwide problem everywhere that there are amphibians, uh, this disease can be found. Um, it's wiped out populations of frogs around the world. And this is one of the big things that we do here at the zoo as part of our amphibian recovery program mm -hmm. um, is work with frogs that have this disease and try to treat them and get them back out into the wild. Okay. Wow. All right. I'm sad to see that. So then what, this little frog is not yellow legged. What's going on? Yes. So... One of the catch-all phrases when a frog gets sick, and it used to be more common to use, was um, just call it red-legged syndrome. Um, so this is actually supposed to be, and it is, a yellow-legged a yellow frog. Um, and usually they have, as you would imagine, really bright yellow legs. Um, this frog, however, came in from a lake that was chytrid positive. Um, and so what you're seeing are really irritated legs on the frog. So when frogs get chytrid, uh, they try to fend it off. You know, they're not just gonna sit there and let something attack their body, just like a human. They're gonna try to ward it off and get it away. Um, so frogs, when they get chytrid, 
Sometimes they'll sloth off their skin because they're trying to shed that fungus off of them, um, but it irritates them a lot. So they turn red in color. Oh my goodness. So Sam, besides the chytrid fungus, like what are some other challenges facing frogs? Yeah, so frogs are actually facing a lot of challenges all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, it could be climate change, which is especially for frogs that live at higher elevation and like snowpack um, with climate change because it's warming up, they're getting less and less territory um, that has the correct temperature that they need to survive. Um, there are fires that are affecting different populations and we see that a lot here in California. Um, even drought, um, yeah, so many different things are affecting frogs. Okay. What if, so like where they actually live could be shrinking or too warm. Um, exactly. And then it's not just natural stuff yeah. or like fires and drought, um, but it could also be introduced fish. Um, a lot yeah. of people will go to lakes and streams and uh, put a supply of fish in and they want to go do catch and release, but not they don't realize necessarily that the fish that they're introducing are actually predators of other animals that already live there, such as frogs. Um, and then the frogs have to learn to adapt or find a new place that doesn't have fish. Um, all right, so thank you, Sam. Um, an audience question I am getting is, um, is that like, what is a natural predator of, a fro of the frog that you would be okay with? Um, so a natural predator of a frog, it really just depends on the species of frog and where they're at. Um, so fish are natural pre natural predators of frogs, um, but so can birds. Birds can be natural predators as well. Mm -hmm. right. um, it really just kind of depends on where they're at <laughs> and what's around. All right. Um, all right. So you kind of mentioned that this is a global issue. Is it all like do do frogs around the globe and other amphibians get this chytrid disease? Yes, um, there are other amphibians around the world that, that get this disease. Um, there's frogs that get this disease. Um, some populations are able to handle it better than others. Um, it, again, it varies population to population, but it's not restricted only to frogs. There's actually a new strand of the fungus that's attacking salamanders now. Um, so that's starting to spread around as well. Okay. Well, that makes me sad, but it makes me feel even more proud of Oakland Zoo because perhaps what they're working with um, and this kind of cool state-of-the-art work we're going to find out about could be helpful to other animals around the world. Are you ready to go on tour, Sam? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So, you know what? We're going to take a drink break, which is what we always do. But right before I'm going to ask, like, why did Oakland Zoo decide to commit to something that seems really complicated and difficult such as this? So Oakland Zoo, I think, committed to this because there was a need for it. Um, and Oakland Zoo just wants to do everything we can to help whatever animals we can. Um, and I think over the years, it's grown even more. So mm -hmm. even though there was a foundation of it here at the zoo before, um, it just grows every year, our commitment and or want to help wildlife, um, whether it's local or not. Yeah, I really appreciate that Oakland Zoo has a love for the smaller creatures that may not be, you know, as sexy and amazing as some of the big furry ones, um, but really so important. So, all right, so speaking of all the frogs, let's talk about the frog edible. So I'm gonna hide you, Sam. We'll see you afterwards for a little toast. Um, so everyone, we're going to talk a little bit about a wonderful, um, a wonderful restaurant in Alameda, right close to Oakland. They make handcrafted cocktails and they have delicious pristine foods and they have a wonderful setup. It's called um, Alley and Vine. So they are the ones who concocted our frog edible and we're going to learn all about it right now. Hello, welcome to Alien Vine. My name is Jaime. Today I will be making a cocktail for you called the Unforgettable. It's inspired by the uh, mountain yellow legged frog. And the ingredients are St. George's Gin, nice local here from Alameda, Le Blanc, 
pineapple juice, lemon juice, and simple syrup. So we are going to start by putting an ounce and a half of the gin into an ice tin. Next, uh, three quarters of an ounce of the Leblanc. of pineapple juice, three quarters of an ounce of lemon juice, and half an ounce of simple syrup. Strain it into the glass. And we are going to finish it with a nice lemon twist for garnish. Cheers. As the uh, mountain yellow legged frog. Thank you, Ali and Vi. You got a little cocktail there, Sam? Yeah, I couldn't find a lemon wedge, but yeah. All right. <laughs> 100 years of Oakland Zoo. I love it. All right. Cheers. This is to you, Sam. We're gonna do our poem. <laughs> Action for wildlife. To Sam, a big hug. Let's do this together now. Chug a lug. Cheers. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Now, what we decided to do is play a game, and we'll see how this goes. But we thought frogs are so crazy that when you look up amazing frogs, it's hard to believe that some that you find are actually real frogs. So we're gonna try a game called, let's call it real or fake. Um, so I'm gonna show some frogs, Sam, and maybe about five, and we're gonna have people guess if they're real or fake. Here they are, what? And um, let's try this. How about this? And once, um, once we give it a go, you'll tell us if we're right or wrong. You ready? Yes. Everybody ready? All right, here we go. This looks like a flat piece of mud with gold sparkles. Is this real or fake? Let's give people a chance. What? It, okay, Sam, what is it? Okay, so this is a real frog. Um, it's a Suriname toad. Uh, they're actually in um, South America. But the cool thing about them, the little specks that you see on the back, um, that's actually where their babies come out of. So they don't lay an egg mass when they reproduce. Um, they and it, it, they like the eggs bury onto the back of the toad, and um, then they pop out as little frogs. So these are one of the ones that don't actually have tadpoles. They just come out looking like little baby. Turn on toads. I would love to see a video of that because that is okay. Someone <laughs> up there is cray cray and making up great stuff. <laughs> I can't even believe it. Okay, what else we got here? All right, frogs. Okay, frogs, you're in the water and on land. You can also be in the sky, real or fake. Hold on. You guys think about it. There's no way. That's that somebody like threw a toy. Real or fake, Sam? This is real. Um, so it's a Wallace's flying frog. Uh, they're found in like Western Indonesia and Borneo. Um, they spend a lot of time up in the trees. And one of the cool things about them is they can actually glide like 50 feet. 
So to, if they're trying to get away from a predator, they'll jump from like a tree branch and you can see the webbing in between their toes is a lot, um, okay. but they can use that to glide to another safe place. All right. Wowza. <laughs> All right. This looks like when people take like a rock and they like Photoshop a funny face on it. Cause that's not even a head. It's a blob with two eyes and a, and a little nose and a mouth. <laughs> Real or fake people. Give them a moment. Okay, Sam. All right. So this one is also real. <laughs> uh, it's a black rain, black rain frog. Um, they lived in the southern coast of Africa. And these guys actually bury into the ground. Um, so they can make little tunnels into the ground that are like six inches deep. Um, and that's how they get their water source. So most frogs, you think they need to be around water. This little kid just digs into the ground. That's wild. Wild. Okay. This looks like frog meets Chewbacca. Real or fake, people? I'm going to cuddle him. Okay, Sam. Okay. So this one is a fake photo, but there is such a thing as a hairy frog. It just doesn't look quite like this. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to have to see that. All right. I need that one. Um, one more. That one. I mean, I know some frogs look really beautiful, but that yellow going into turquoise with blue and black perfectly artistically created. I'm not so sure. People real or fake? Sam? So this one is real. So this is a, one of the many species of poison dart frogs that there are. Wow. Um, and we actually have some frogs like this down in our rad room, which is hopefully going to be opening up soon. So yeah. if you come to the zoo, check them out. All right. Wow. Thanks, Sam. Woohoo! How'd you guys do out there? Um, all right. One more. So we're getting a question via... They're coming everywhere. Text. Um, what other, do you know? What other some of the other cool frogs the zoo has? Oh, you know, I can't think of them right now because I don't go down there that often because I'm so focused on we ours. Panamanian golden frog. But we have yeah. I know we had Panamanian golden frogs. I think we had some mantellas. Yeah. At some point. Mm -hmm. um, we have some very endangered gecko. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are really cool things down the rad room, but I get so focused on my frogs that I don't go down there. <laughs> I'm like, You're just too busy to get around, but some fantastic amphibians, including frogs. Yeah, there are definitely, we have a really large selection, really cool selection of amphibians and reptiles um, down in the rad room. So right. definitely check them out. And I should go check them out more too. Yeah, let's go together. Reopening yeah. the Richmond, <laughs> Oakland Zoo. All right, so let's move on. We Oakland Zoo decided to take this on. Looks like this is where you work, Sam. What was the big vision for amphibian recovery? Like, let's that you told me they decided to do this. What is it that they decided to do? Yeah, so when we started this recovery program um, before my time here, it was actually because there were keepers here that were really dedicated and wanted to do something to help amphibians. Um, so they really got to push for this change so that way the zoo could be involved in it um, because they were so passionate about it. Um, there was also a need for it. Um, they had just started the species survival plan and there were some really critical amphibians on there that they wanted zoos to help with um, as part of the survival plan. Um, so. From that, it has evolved and we've grown and we want to keep doing what we can to help amphibians. Like you said earlier, they're not necessarily the big charismatic megafauna mm -hmm. that everybody thinks of, but they're still really important to the environment. It's one of those creatures where people may not think about them a lot because they're small, but if they disappear from the environment, it's going to throw off a whole lot more. I agree. And imagine not hearing that beautiful sound when you're camping or or even at the zoo in the evening, you can hear some sort of frog and it's pretty magical. Yeah. So this looks like the lab. And the question I had for you, Sam, is so you're working in here. 
as the conservation biologist? Like who else at the zoo participates in making this so, in making this a reality? Yeah, so there's actually so many people here at the zoo that are involved in this, and it may be people that you don't necessarily think about. Um, so there's me and the rest of the bio team, which are animal care keepers, um, who take care of them daily. But we also have a vet team who can help us if there are medical needs that arise, um, other than dealing with the kitchen that we work with. Um, but maintenance helps. So especially in the summer when it gets really hot, if our AC were to go out, maintenance comes down and helps us real quick, set it up generators and get an AC back up. Um, education does a whole lot of talking about this when they're out on the public because we're behind the scenes. People don't always get to see this. So our education department does a really good job of integrating it into what they talk about um, marketing. They come on releases with us or help shoot photos and stuff. And they share it as well on social media to get the word out. Um, really, there's so many people here at the zoo that are involved in this in some way or another. I love it. That's fantastic. So that's at the zoo. But then it seems like this is kind of a, a it takes partnerships and alliances and good relationships. So what other agencies and groups are involved? Yeah, so this is definitely not a one man show. Um, we all have to work together uh, in order to do what we can for the species. And we all have different backgrounds and different expertise. So there's Oakland Zoo, but we've also worked with National Park Service, Forest Service, um, Fish and Wildlife. Uh, San Francisco Zoo is actually, they have a frog program as well, so we work with them. Um, but it's not limited to that. There's biologists at PG&E, um, Caltrans, uh, uh, UC Santa Barbara, that all these people, we work with all of them um, all the time. And it's not, we get to see each other on releases most of the time, so that's pretty cool. But we have calls throughout the year where we all get on the phone together and talk about what's happening with the frog species all over. Okay, because you make decisions together. That's really, yeah. That's, that's great. I mean, you know, we talk about bureaucracy and how things can really not work out and people be blocked in the things they want to do, but Oakland Zoo and you, Sam, um, just as create good relationships and smooth sailing and, and together with so much amazing communication. And everyone just seems like they're stepping up to the plate for these frogs together and, and that is such a success. So let's talk about how it all works out. Um, like take me, take us through your journey, starting with this habitat that looks kind of intense, Sam. What, where is, and that looks like a little helicopter. So how does it all begin? How do you go get the tadpoles that start this off? Yes, so it all starts with the tadpoles. Um, and this is where the team effort comes in um, and takes a lot of coordination. So depending on the population of frogs that we get in, because they don't all come from the same location. Um, it could be a lake like this, it could be a stream. Um, but for the most part, they're all really high elevation and pretty remote places to get to. Um, so some of them, you might be able to do a day trip out and hike to where you need to, to collect tadpoles and then hike back in the same day. Um, other places, you can't do that. It's just the tadpoles would get too warm and they won't pack well on your back because <laughs> you have to carry them. Um, okay. Yeah, on your back. Um, like, do you insert them into your back like that frog? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, this picture is of a really remote lake. So there were field biologists that hiked out early, um, went out there and collected, but obviously it's too far to hike back with the tadpoles. So they had to have a helicopter come pick up the tadpoles from that location and bring them back. Well, who's your helicopter people? Yeah, so the helicopter people is run by the National Park Service. So okay. the helipad we usually go to is at Sequoia Kings Canyon mm -hmm. National Park. Um, so it takes a lot of coordination, not just between us and the biologists that are going out into the field to make sure we get there at the same time for pickup mm -hmm. and pass offs. Um, but we have to make sure that the helicopter is going to be available as well. And National Park Service helps with that. Wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. So here's, looks like a partner in the field, probably 
working with tadpoles. Yes. So uh, this is Tom Smith. He helps run our swabs a lot at um, the Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Lab. He works for UC mm -hmm. Santa Barbara. But he um, actually, I got to go with him on this trip. So I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, but we got the chance to go out last year um, to hike and go collect tadpoles to bring back to the zoo. Um, so this was one of those like locations and you can see it's just like a little stream, little creek. It's a lot different than that massive pond that was in the other one. Mm -hmm. um, but this one, it was again, really high elevation, very thin air. Um, you definitely had to be in shape to do this, um, but it was totally worth it. But all that gear that you see there, you also have to be able to pack all that on your back and carry it with you out into the field. And then you got to carry it back. And when you carry it back, it's full of water and tadpoles. <laughs> Wow. So it gets to be a lot. But what he's doing in this photo here is we had just finished skimming to try to collect tadpoles. Um, so in the white nets that are in the water, there's a whole bunch of tadpoles. And then what he's doing is counting the tadpoles. So that way we only bring back a certain number out of the field. Okay. Um, we don't want to bring in every animal that we collect because um, that's not good for the population. So. Yeah. So yeah. you're making calculated decisions on how many to grab from different places and yeah and that's a big the field biologists they have all the credit for that because they go out and do population counts and surveys all throughout the summer when they're able to um, and then they report the numbers that they see to fish and wildlife and then from that number they're allowed to collect up to a certain percentage of the animals but it also depends on the space and the labs um, on what the zoo is able to bring in. Right. So. so it's complicated. All right. Oops. And I've lost you. It's so complicated. Come back, Sam. All right. Here we are with Sam again. And welcome Come back. back. <laughs> So the next thing I want to, I'm wondering is like now you're going to bring them to the zoo and this looks like you somewhere in that lab um, working away. Like what, what is it like? First of all, where are you? What's going on here? And then what's it like just caring for these little beings? Yeah. So this is actually a window that's in the conservation office that looks into the labs because we are right next door to each other, share a wall. Mm -hmm. um, so we have this window in the office, which is great for if people come by, uh, we can show them into the labs. Um, but I am in there working uh, daily. It's just normal husbandry for everything, really, which means we check on the health of the animals. Uh, we make sure they get fed proper nutrition. We check their water quality because they're mostly an aquatic species. Um, clean the tanks. So just anything to make the frogs happy and healthy during their stay here. Um, all right, so I do have a question from the audience and that's like, is it always a certain amount of time before they start sprouting their legs? Can you, do you know when to expect it? Or are you like surprised? Is it like a wonderful day? Um, so they all morph at different times. Mm -hmm. As much as I wish they all just came in and all, all were on the same track mm -hmm. and had a schedule, because that would make it so much easier to know when to do treatment and everything. Um, they don't. Mm -hmm. We've had some tadpoles come in and they morph really quickly within just like a couple weeks. Um, and then we have had other tadpoles who decide to stay tadpoles for like a year. Mm -hmm. uh, so it really just depends on the individual. And as they turn into frogs, is their personalities? Do you notice more assertive ones, shyer ones? Yeah. So when they morph in the frogs, usually everybody's really jumpy at first because yeah. they just change completely. And then we're handling them, doing an initial treatment on them to make sure that they're healthy. Um, but once they've been here a while, you start to see personality changes in them. So like I'll walk into a lab and there are a couple tanks where frogs will just scatter, um, which is great because that's what we want. We don't want them getting used to yeah, right. they're getting released. And then there's other ones that you walk in the lab and they like make eye contact with you and they're like, do you have food for us? Oh. We're not afraid of you. We know you, we know you feed us. <laughs> so, yeah. What are you feeding them? Um, so they mostly, okay, so tadpoles get a gel mixture. It's kind of like a 
jello with a whole bunch of other nutrients in it. Just it's nutrient packed. It has mm-hmm. a lot of uh, vitamins and everything else they need for tadpoles. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as they go into frogs, frogs typically get crickets of different sizes, just depending on how big the frog is. And do crickets ever get out, Sam, and hop around the office making really intense noises? I mean, maybe just once in a while when they want to join the party. (laughs) Um, All right. I love it. Um, So, okay. And is it, how do you know when, like, do they have to be a certain age or a certain robustness to know, like, this one's ready to kind of be treated and released? How do you know? Yeah, so for treatment and release, um, frogs have to be a specific size in order to get released. Mm -hmm. Um, So they have to be 40 millimeters snout vent length, which is just kind of like their body length. Mm -hmm. Um, And they have to be that in order to get pit tags. So every frog that gets released gets a pit tag, which is the same thing as like a micro trip for a dog or cat. Okay. Much smaller. (laughs) Um, So they have to be at least that size before we can even do immune priming and treatment and all of that. All right, so interesting. And um, and question that came in is like, what are some challenges you run into in this process of keeping them? Um, yeah, so for keeping them, there are challenges. I think the biggest one is just knowing that they have a disease when they come in. That's just always going to be a challenge, yeah. um, but it's a challenge that we, accepted and knew in advance that that's what we were working with. Um, But they're frogs, so they are very jumpy. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think the biggest challenge for a lot of people who work with them um, is when they jump out of your hands and onto the floor because they're fast. Yeah. They go under tanks. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so you have to crawl around on the floor and get them back. Doesn't happen often. And the more you work with them, you get quicker hands. Yeah. And Um, it means they're robust. Yeah. Okay. So. All right. So it looks like someone on your crew is, what are they doing in this part, in this picture? Yeah. So this is actually a former intern of ours and she was here when we were doing pit tags. Mm-hmm. Um, so she's actually helping get morphs on the frogs, which is when we measure them and weigh them um, just before we pit tag them. All right. And then speaking of pit tags, this is a pit tag, these tiny, tiny things. Yes, those tiny things are each individual pit tags. Okay. And then how does a, like, how are you inserting that or attaching that? Like, so the, and what does the tag do? What is a pit tag? Yeah, so a pit tag is kind of like a microchip. Um, Mm -hmm. So they don't just transmit up to a satellite and come back. Um, But you can get this wand, essentially, to wave over a pit tag or an animal that has it, and it's going to pop up with a 16-digit number. Um, But what that does and how it helps us is every frog that gets released then has an individual 16-digit number associated with it. Okay. So when it gets released and the biologists go out and do their studies and capture, like, capture recaptures, um, they can find a frog, scan it, get that 16 digit number, see if it was at a zoo, what zoo it was at, if it was a control group, a treatment group, when it was collected, when it got released and all this other information, um, because we can put that in a database and look up the numbers. All right, that's incredible, they're so (laughs) tiny. And then this is, so then this is the treatment. So they come in as tadpoles with this chytrid fungus. And then what is it you're doing with the swab that actually is the actual treatment? Okay, yeah. So the treatment as a whole, it's a large process. So when these animals come in, they come in as tadpoles. Um, Chytrid only affects the keratinized parts of a frog. So when they're a tadpole, it's just around their mouth. Um, So there's not a lot of surface area on the tadpole for it to really have a major effect and cause like, you know, the red legs and such. Um, But as they morph into frogs, they get more of that keratin on their body. So there's more surface area that the fungus can grow on, um, which makes it worse for them. So every frog that comes in, as soon as they morph, every frog gets an initial treatment, which is just um, a little bath, essentially. So it's a liquid medicine that we mix with water. 
Um, and it's an 11 day treatment. And then after that, we'll do a swab on them and we'll send that off just to make sure that we actually got rid of the disease. Oh, okay. At that point, they stay here for one to two years and depending on how long it takes them to get to that 40 millimeters to get released. Um, and then once they hit that and they do the pit tagging and the um, measurements and all that, we do what's called inoculations or immune yeah. priming. So during this time, we actually split the frogs in half for the most part. So it was like a 50-50. Um, so the control group- Not split a frog in half. Not a frog in half, but the population, yeah. yes. Better. <laughs> that would be really bad to split a frog in half. Bad conservation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so half of the frogs will be a control group. So they're not, they're just kind of kept as they are. The other half, we actually give them the fungus again. Um, and it kind of acts as like a booster shot. Essentially. Um, so their body can start trying to react and fend off the fungus again. Um, we only let it go to a certain point because we don't want them to get overloaded with the fungus. Um, so during this time, we do swabs and we send them off each day to or each week. Um, and if it gets too crazy um, of a high number, we'll start treatment on them early. If not, we will just start them all after three weeks. At this point, they go through treatment again for the 11 days. Um, and then post treatment. So after those 11 days, we do some more swabs to guarantee that they're clear and don't have the fungus again. And then they are all good to go to get released. So wow. Okay. That's, that's quite a process. How amazing yeah. like the detail and the time and the swabbing and the enzyme baths, like such, yeah. such science behind that. And it must be such a meticulous process, but um, and then the whole point is to put them back in the wild. So yes. I was, we were curious about that process. So now you're getting, what do you, you're packing them up, I guess. Packing them up. Yeah. So when they go to get released, which is a fantastic day, because you get to Yay. see all these frogs that you've worked with for so long get released. Yeah. Um, they each go in their own individual container mm -hmm. and each Container is labeled with their pit tag number and then any other information that we might need for that release. So it could be the sex of the frog. It could be which location they're going to get released to. Mm. Um, it really just depends. But they all have their pit tag number written on the top. So this is Kyle. He's one of the staff members who helps in the bio building and is on the bio team. He is packing up the frogs the morning of um, for release. And release days start really early for us. Um, as in, I usually get to the zoo at like 4.30 a.m. to start catching up frogs and packing them up so they can get released. Wow. And so when you, is there one frog per little container? Yep. So one frog per little container. Okay. And then you're putting them like in a cooler. Does it have to be cool? Yep. So we want to keep them cool. So they all go on these, um, their individual containers and then we package them up into some coolers. Mm -hmm. uh, load them up in the car. Um, they get ice packs in the coolers to help keep them cool. Uh, but then we load them up in the car and drive them out to whether it's the helipad because they're going to get flown out or we could drive them to a location to get released. Mm -hmm. um, it really just, again, depends on the population, but package them up, load them up and drive them. <laughs> Sam, I've noticed um, that you sometimes take people from the Oakland Zoo that aren't biologists or animal care people. They could be from totally different departments. Like, why Why do you guys do that? Yeah, we really love taking people with us from other departments in the zoo because mm -hmm. uh, it's something that, one, is just really cool to do, but it gives other staff members a chance to be involved in the conservation hands-on. Mm -hmm. um, so... I mean, as you know, we like to think of conservation as not just the department of conservation, but everybody at the zoo. Everybody at the zoo is involved in conservation in some way or another, whether they realize it or not. Um, but it's great to bring people in who don't work with animals all the time. And they're just fascinated by the frogs themselves, but also this grand adventure of being able to be part of 
the release. I love it. Road trip with biologists and frogs to a beautiful place to see the magic of a release. One day I'm going to get up early enough to do this with you, Sam. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about that release. Here people are with their Taking Action for Wildlife shirts. Um, opening the cooler, where are they now? Yeah, so this photo was actually taken at the helipad at Sequoia Kings Canyon. Mm -hmm. um, so who you see is myself, um, uh, Danny from National Park Service, and Jesse from San Francisco Zoo. Um, the three of us have worked together for a couple of years now and really closely. Um, but what we're doing is organizing frogs and figuring out who's going to go where. Um, so like I said earlier, San Francisco Zoo also is involved in this project some. So a lot of the times um, we see each other and we can ask each other questions, which is great. But we'll get tadpoles in and we'll split the populations in half. So Oakland Zoo will get half and then San Francisco will get half. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we meet back up for release, we have to go through and count. Um, sometimes we they pick two different uh, release locations. So they'll be like, we want to, you all, you both have this many frogs total from this one population. We want to split them evenly going to these other two places. So you, what we're doing is essentially organizing the frogs, getting them ready, um, putting the different release locations in different coolers. That way, when the helicopter flies out into the field, um, it's a lot easier for the helicopter staff to just grab one cooler off and hand it to the biologist. Okay. Um, that way they're not sitting there doing this out in the field. <laughs> okay. So this, I love this shot. So is this, you guys loading up the helicopter? Yep. That's it. So all the frogs in those coolers are ready to go. They're separated, organized. Um, and we just take the coolers out to the helicopter, load them up and then watch them fly away. <laughs> and then on the other side, there's biologists that receive them and they release them into into where they're supposed to go. Yeah, so this is another one of those really large coordinations where mm -hmm. we have to make sure we time it with the helipad and the field biologists. That way everybody's in place. That way the frogs aren't just hanging out. All right. And here's, you know, full healthy frog in the wild. <laughs> um, how rewarding. That's so fantastic. Um, so my next question is, um, so the zoo, you know, not only are you inspiring the staff, you mentioned that, um, you know, the public, it's a little hard for them to, you know, not everyone makes it to the conservation office that's way behind the scenes to look through the little screen, you know, window to see. Um, how, like, what are the ways we're t telling the story to the public? Um, so a big way is we're very dependent on our education staff to talk to people. Um, but there's other ways in, that we communicate this work with the guests that when they come to the zoo. Um, so currently, actually, mm -hmm. um, we have our Q4C, our quarters for conservation. Um, so if you come to the zoo, um, you'll see these kiosks at both the upper and the lower entrance to the zoo. Um, so when you come, everybody should be getting a token when they come in. Um, and that token you can use to vote for a project that you want to support conservation wise, because 50 cents of every ticket sold and two dollars of every membership actually gets designated towards conservation. Mm -hmm. um, so just coming to the zoo, you are supporting a project no matter what. So right now, uh, one of the options is our frog project. So if you come to the zoo, mm -hmm. I say vote for the frogs. Come to the zoo and vote for frogs. I love it. Um, okay, so what was, and then you mentioned the rad room. So the reptile and amphibian room at Oakland Zoo is about to reopen. So you can come visit all of our beautiful amphibians and reptiles there, which is very exciting. Yes. I think next weekend. Yeah, I think it's very soon. Very soon. We're all very excited. All right. So what is a moment that you felt, Sam, in your time here where you're like, yes, this is working. I feel really good about this. I feel like I think that like every release we have, because yeah. really at the release, it's you get to see the frogs that you took care of every day mm -hmm. for the past one to two years. Um, they made it, they don't have the fungus anymore. And you get to see them at least go on the helicopter to get back out into the wild. And you know that they're going to be 
released and that you've done something, even if it's just a little tiny part to get them back out into the wild. Um, I love it. And, you know, they're all like inoculated and, and ready to face life. And then in general, Sam, what's something that just keeps you optimistic? It's with all those problems you listed, it seems it can be rough out there, but you come to your job every day and I know you're very positive every day. So what keeps you that way? I think just knowing that there's other people um, that have the same passion, whether it's about frogs and, or other animals in general, but like we were talking about way back at the beginning where it's not just a one man show. There's all these different partners and uh, people that are involved in this, just the passion behind everybody to do their part for these animals is just fantastic. All right. I love it. All right. Well, good segue. Speaking of doing your part, um, a question that came up that should come up and I love when it comes up is what can the average person do? Um, to help these animals or more? Yeah, so there's a lot people can do. Um, so if you have a backyard, one thing you can do is set up just like a tiny little habitat. That way, if a little critter comes along, he can stop, take a rest in your yard and keep going. Um, but if you see a frog out in the wild, um, it's best just to take a picture of them. Um, you don't want to pick them up. Like I said, they're really sensitive to changes in the environment, but if you have lotion or sunscreen or anything on your hands, that they can actually get that absorbed through their skin. Um, so you just kind of want to look, don't touch. Photos are great because you get to look at them again. Um, but you can join cleanups. So we have mm -hmm. like a creek cleanup that we do here at the zoo. Um, and then I think we're also starting up our community cleanups again. Yeah, we have a no to plastic. So you can go out into Oakland with the crew from Oakland Zoo, get a ride. Yeah, so all those cleanups, even though you're thinking it's like, oh, I'm just picking up a watershed. But that watershed is home to animals. It's home to amphibians. Mm -hmm. um, so just by picking that up, you're helping them out. All right. I love it. Um, what if, okay. Here's a question that came in. What if I have a pet frog and I think that maybe he'd rather live in the wild? Should I release him? No, <laughs> you should not release him. Um, you don't ever really want to release any pets into the wild because one, they're not used to it. They're not going to really know what to do. Um, and if they do figure out how to survive, they're actually going to throw off that ecosystem, um, which is how we get a lot of invasive plants and animals in places and you see a shift in the dynamic and a shift in the species in certain areas. Okay. Thanks for that. I know Oakland Zoo has a living with wildlife page that hopefully they can post in the chat that has a lot of information about how you can help um, various species. If you find them, if you see them, all kinds of different species in the Bay Area because it's, it's such a local issue. Um, all right, Sam, um, I want to take this moment to say thank you so much um, just for deciding to, let's see, I made something special for you. <laughs> Your thank you. <laughs> um, just thank you to you and Oakland Zoo and the whole team that you have there and all those agencies. Um, I hope it gave me hope. So I'm sure it can give anyone listening to this or recording hope that it it's a, it seems like such a struggle, but when so many people and someone with your background and skills um, has the passion for this small, small and so important creature, um, we can all just rest a tiny bit easier tonight um, knowing such good things are happening. And thank you once again and cheers to you, Sam. Oh, thanks for having me. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. All right. Um, have a great night, Sam. Thanks. You too. Night, everybody. <laughs>